Today at the National Press Club, the Federal Energy Minister, Chris Bowen. Energy policy has been a fraught business in Australia for more than a decade. Mr Bowen's been faced with an energy crisis hitting the East Coast in his first weeks in office. Chris Bowen with today's National Press Club address. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia in today's Westpac address. My name is Andrew Tilbert, I'm the Vice President of the Club and I'm also the Federal Political Correspondent for the Australian Financial Review. Today's guest is Chris Bowen, Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Arguably no minister in the Albanese government has had to deal with a bigger shock to the system than uh, Mr Bowen, who inherited an energy crisis just days after being sworn into office. Um, he managed to keep the lights on, but how Mr Bowen, Bowen goes juggling the need for affordable and reliable energy on one hand with Labor's ambitions for higher climate change reduction targets on the other will be crucial to the government's political longevity. If you're following the conversation online, you can find us on Twitter. Our user handle is Press Club Ost, and our hashtag is NPC. Everyone, please welcome the Minister, Chris Bowen. Ujuru Nunakal, put it simply but beautifully. This land was ours, you may recall, before you came along at all. In celebrating the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people today, I also pay my respects to any Indigenous people present. And I also want to take a moment to specifically acknowledge the people of the Torres Strait. The people of the Torres Strait can't simply be a pro forma addendum to our standard acknowledgement of country. As Australia under the new government rightly focuses on the challenges of climate change in the Pacific, we can't forget that many of our own citizens are facing exactly the same challenges in the Torres Strait. We can't forget it, and under this government, we won't forget it. When I leave the press club this afternoon, I'll be flying directly to the Torres Strait to talk with elders and owners about the impacts of climate change on them and their country. I'm delighted I'll be joined by my colleagues, Senator Jan Stewart and Nita Green, and also by the Assistant Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Jenny McAllister, whom I've asked to have carriage of climate adaptation. And Jenny's also joining us in the room today. Well, it's tempting to say that May 21 saw the winds of change blow through our country. But, but in fact, a gale blew away nine years of climate delay, denial and dysfunction. After years of climate change policy being weaponised by conservatives, after years of baseless fear campaigns about the cost of climate action, there was a climate election, and that election resulted in a Labor victory with an ambitious climate agenda. Of course, real victory on climate doesn't come on election day. Real victory comes with achievement in government, with progress in policy and with a focus on delivery. And today I'm going to focus on Labor's approach to delivery and achievement in climate. Now, of course, as Andrew said, I have had a busy few weeks as Minister for Climate and Energy. You might have noticed. And I'll say a bit about this at the outset. We've seen in dramatic form in the last few weeks the real life results of that delay, denial and dysfunction when it comes to energy policy. This really has been a tailor-made crisis. Nine years of stop-start policy making, direct action, an attempt to abolish and then water down the renewable energy target, an attempt to abolish and then constantly undermine ARENA and the CFC, an aborted clean energy target, a discarded national energy guarantee, the demonising of renewables, the disparagement of storage as being as effective as the big prawn, campaigns of denigration against companies and CEOs who dared to argue that a well-managed transition to renewables was important, the former government's signature energy investment, Snowy 2.0, running 18 months late, they knew this, of course, before the election, but hid it from the public and from the market, which needs this information to make decisions about new investments. In their final year in office, they oversaw one of the biggest spikes in emissions in 15 years, 4.1 million tonnes. That is their legacy. We know that good climate and energy policy is also good economic policy. It doesn't rely on recession and drought for short-term and temporary emissions reduction. It locks in meaningful emissions reduction. They also knew, of course, that electricity prices were skyrocketing on their watch. 
but they cynically decided to leave it to the new government to announce the increase in the default market offer. They weren't just incompetent, they were dishonest about it. And all this came at a great cost to the country, a dive in renewable energy investment, not enough investment in storage, not enough investment in transmission. And further uncertainty was created for the market through their announcing of the underwriting new generation investments program, which hasn't seen a single watt added to the market. Lots of big announcements, but not one watt of generation funded or underwritten by the previous government, despite all the spin. This was the worst of all, of all worlds. They managed to chill private sector investment by announcing that they would invest, but then they didn't actually deliver any of that investment themselves. Now we see the results. And by their early actions, the now opposition are making themselves irrelevant to the debate. No recognition or contrition for their actions. More denigration of renewables by the new leader of the opposition. A unilateral declaration by him, with no reference to his party room, that the opposition will not support the government's climate change bill, despite the benefits for business of enshrining certainty. Bizarre and laughable claims that somehow the new government even talking about renewable energy somehow spooked coal-fired power generators into not working, and an economically illiterate attempt to argue that the answer to high power prices is to introduce the most expensive form of energy that also takes many years to build, nuclear. And so the opposition has chosen to count themselves out of a sensible discussion on the most pressing issue facing our country climate change and energy. I was interested to see if some bipartisanship was possible in relation to one of the biggest transformations our economy has ever been through. I would have been interested to pursue that, but if their contribution over the last month is anything to go by, they appear not to have received the memo from the Australian people issued on May 21st, and they have by their own actions made themselves irrelevant in this debate. And so, enough about them to the future. The key to our approach in government and the key to Australia's success were the same principles that underpinned the Powering Australia policy and our successful election campaign. Namely, a focus on the economic opportunities for Australia of a real, well-designed climate action and well-integrated industry and economic policy. Bringing Australians together from the regions to the cities, from the renewable sector to traditional energy, an end to the toxic politics of identity, of division, an effort to divide Australians against each other on their matter of climate change, an effort to ensure that the economic dividend of real action on climate change is fairly spread across the entire country. Working with business to unleash the pent-up private investment in energy generation, which has been waiting for a government that gets it, waiting for a government that understands the need to provide sensible and stable policy frameworks. Working in partnership with all other governments and those who have a stake to drive this once in a century transformation. And a commitment to a carefully designed and ambitious but achievable set of policies which ensure our approach is both credible and substantive. That approach marked our election campaign. That approach will mark our tenure. When the Prime Minister and I signed the letter notifying the UN of Australia's new 43% emissions reduction target, we invited representatives of the business community and the trade union movement, big energy generators and big energy users, manufacturers and climate groups. We did that deliberately to underline the fact that we really are all in this together, that it really is time for the climate change wars to end. And this approach will continue in government. Today, I'm outlining the next steps in the government's climate agenda. When Parliament resumes in late July, we'll be introducing two pieces of legislation which will progress the agenda for which we received a mandate on May 21. Firstly, the Treasurer and I will take through legislation which implements our electric vehicle tax cut. We promise to cut the tariffs and abolish the fringe benefits tax on affordable EVs from 1 July, and that's exactly what we'll do. Of course, the Parliament doesn't sit until late July, and so we'll ask the Tax Office to make the normal arrangements to ensure it is implemented retrospectively from the 1st of July, in accordance with the usual procedure. And of course, the EV tax cut is just one part of our electric vehicle policy. We also promise driving the nation to deliver a fast charger once every 150 kilometres 
on our nation's highways, to convert the Commonwealth fleet to 75% no emissions vehicles, to create a national hydrogen highway refuelling network to deliver stations on Australia's busiest freight routes, and the development of Australia's first national electric vehicle strategy. We've already been working away behind the scenes on implementing each of these and are making good headway and I look forward to providing more progress reports on each element in the not too distant future. And secondly, I'll introduce into the House in the first week of sittings, the Albanese government's climate change bill. We've been crystal clear in opposition and in government. We regard enshrining the nation's emissions reduction targets in legislation as best practice. It helps provide policy certainty and stability for the investor community that they so desperately crave. And today I'm announcing the shape of the Albanese government's climate change bill. It will be simple yet powerful. The bill will have essentially four elements. Firstly, we'll seek to enshrine in law our nationally determined contribution of 43% emissions reduction by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2050. Secondly, we will explicitly task in law the Climate Change Authority to assess and publish progress against these targets and advise government on future targets, including the 2035 target. Thirdly, we will legislate a requirement for the Minister for Climate Change to report annually to Parliament on progress in meeting our targets. I see this report as frankly being similar to the Closing the Gap report, forcing the government to be transparent about progress and plans and frankly, obliging the opposition of the day to share its views and plans as well. To focus the mind of parliamentarians on what the nation is doing to deal with this, our most pressing challenge. And finally, as part of the consequential legislation, we'll insert the nation's targets in the objectives and functions of a range of government agencies, including ARENA, CFC, Infrastructure Australia and the NAIF. That is what we'll put to Parliament. Now I say publicly and transparently what I've also indicated privately to members of the crossbench. If they have ideas, suggestions, amendments, which are complementary to the government's agenda, which are sensible additions to our plan, then I'm happy to consider them in good faith. I say this in the spirit of cooperation. If there's a good idea which improves, not undermines the bill, I'm happy to hear it and we'll work with it. But we won't be entertaining any amendments which are not consistent with our agenda and our mandate. And just as we've been crystal clear that we regard legislation as being best practice, we've also been clear that the legislation is not required. And if the parliament doesn't wish to pass it, we'll simply get on with the job, as we've already started to do. Now, of course, there's much in our policy agenda that doesn't need legislation at all. High on our list of priorities is the much needed upgrade to our nation's transmission system. Our grid is not fit for purpose and our rewiring the nation program will make it so. Rewiring the nation will help us get the renewable energy from where it's generated to where it'll be consumed. This will include, under our government, increasingly offshore wind. And it will help us manage the electricity system as we shift to a much higher renewable share of generation. They say the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, and that's true everywhere. But across our country, it's normally blowing or shining somewhere. And improved transmission will help us get that renewable energy from wherever it's being generated at that time to where we need it. Now we're fortunate as we embark on rewiring the nation that we have the blueprint ready to go. In fact, tomorrow, AEMO will release the 2022 Integrated Systems Plan, the final version of it. The ISP shows our energy mix continuing to change dramatically, predicting the step change scenario as the most likely. The prediction of this rate of change is informed not just by the impressive expertise in AEMO, but by consultation with over 1,500 stakeholders, including energy users and generators, governments, regulators and analysts. The sector has been honest about the pace of change in the market. The previous government was not, which has left us playing catch up as we build out new generation. The pace of change we are already experiencing represents a massive need for new investment in flexible and firm capacity to complement renewables. That's the focus of the capacity mechanism I'm working with my state and territory colleagues to deliver, ensuring the market is sending the right signal for capacity and reliability we need as we undertake this unprecedented level of energy transformation. Let me be very clear, the capacity mechanism our government delivers in partnership with the states and territories will be utterly consistent with our emissions reduction goals and will encourage the use of new technology, technologies and renewables. 
The ISP lays out the scale of this over the next 30 years. Electricity demand to nearly double across the grid, storage capacity to increase by a factor of 30, and we already know well the task in transmission. Billions in job creating investment to connect Australian households and industry to affordable firm renewables. Tomorrow's ISP will set out the timelines for delivery of major pieces of transmission infrastructure. It'll set the dates for critical projects like the Marinus Link that will connect Tasmania's hydro to the mainland with new undersea cables, and Hume Link and the second interconnector between Victoria and New South Wales that will allow electricity from renewable and dispatchable sources to flow from where it's generated to where it's needed in our homes and industries. Let me say this is a world-class document. It's a roadmap for the transmission revolution our country so desperately needs. And so I welcome the ISP final document being released tomorrow. The only problem with the ISP is that it wasn't properly funded. Under previous arrangements, it would have taken too long to implement this very good plan. Rewiring the Nation will fix that. Guided by EMO, the CFC and my department, Rewiring the Nation will enable the new government to get on with the job and implement the ISP fully. I look forward to working with my fellow energy ministers to modernise the grid, implement the ISP and provide the country with more renewables, more transmission and more storage. Now, important as the ISP is, it's not enough. It only covers electricity transmission. Our transformation needs to be more than transmission. We need an integrated national plan which covers all the investments needed for a renewable economy. The plan is to cover what storage we need and where. It needs to cover what green hydrogen we need and the pipelines we need to get it around the country. It needs to cover all the necessary investment. It needs to cover the vital enablers to that program, like the upskilling of our workforce and making things in Australia again. I was delighted when the State and Territory Energy Ministers, Labor, Liberal and Green, all represented around the table, unanimously agreed to work with me on exactly that plan at our recent meeting. I've described it as the ISP on steroids. Now, the best time to start working on that plan was 10 years ago, and the second best time is now. And that's exactly what we're doing. And so this vital work begins as we begin this important national project. You know, I'm often fond of saying 2030 is actually not that far away. This is the most dramatic economic transformation our nation has faced in the modern era. And we have eight years, just over 90 months to do it. That means we have to be all in. And we are. The federal government is. The states and territories are. They've all expressed a real desire to work with us in the national interest. Businesses, unions are. The country's in. And we're rejoining the global pack. While the rest of the world has been ratcheting up their ambition, the previous government has left us a policy laggard. And that's had ramifications for our economic and strategic interests. Climate change and emissions reduction is, of course, a global problem and we need to all pull together with our international partners to solve it. And we act in recognition that climate change is a primary and economic security challenge for our region and an existential threat to the island nations of the Pacific. But climate change isn't just a threat. It's an economic opportunity for Australia and our partners. By 2030, our ambition is to be exporting clean energy, critical minerals, batteries and components, as well as clean steel and aluminium commodities produced by a thriving Australian economy, driven by skills and innovation of Australians working in thousands of jobs in all our regions. Hydrogen is a great example. If we get this right, by 2030, Australia will be a major player in the global hydrogen industry. We'll be using our natural resources, including solar, onshore and offshore wind, to generate export quantities of hydrogen and providing for its use domestically. We will use hydrogen progressively to decarbonise existing industries, heavy transport links, and for chemical production. And we won't just be powering Australia with renewable energy, we'll be exporting that power across the world. The world and our fast-growing region needs clean energy in vast quantities. Under the Albanese government, Australia's regions will be at the heart of this change and this opportunity, not a footnote to it. Exporting clean energy, energy intensive industrial products like green steel and aluminium and other products like solar cells, electrolyzers and batteries will all help power the clean energy economies of our region, strengthening supply chains and bolstering energy security. So being a good global citizen isn't separate to our national economic interest. It's key to it. The world's climate emergency really is Australia's jobs opportunity. 
We've already moved quickly to demonstrate to our international partners that we're here to help and to lead. I've held in the last month discussions with US Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, with President Biden's Special Envoy for Climate Change, John Kerry, as well as the COP26 President, Alok Sharma. It's fair to say the reception to our government's approach has been very warm, with a shared sense of excitement about the opportunities for strengthening the economic ties with these key partners in the global transformation underway. I'll be continuing these conversations at the Sydney Energy Forum next month with visiting energy ministers from around the world. I had the pleasure of meeting the Prime Minister of the Cook Islands in Sydney recently to discuss the climate crisis and look forward to welcoming Cedric Schuster, Samoa's Minister for Natural Resources and Environment to the Sydney Energy Forum. This marks the start of a genuine partnership with our Pacific family to achieve ambitious international response to climate change, including talking with them about jointly hosting a future COP. Climate change has been a focus of the Foreign Minister's engagement in the Pacific since the election and of the Prime Minister's remarks to his counterparts at the recent Quad Leaders meeting and the Major Economies Forum, of course. The government will continue to support our partners in the region as they work to address climate change, including with new financing arrangements. As we begin on this important project, both abroad and at home, I reckon it's appropriate to ask the question, what will success look like in 2030? By 2030, of course, if we're successful, our emissions will be at least 43% lower than 2005 levels. That's more than 130 million tonnes lower than they are today. By 2030, we'll still be exporting energy as a country and employing thousands of people as we do so, but we'll be exporting renewable energy via submarine cables and green hydrogen. A renewable energy superpower won't be a concept, it'll be a lived reality. By 2030, we'll be genuine partners with the Pacific in ambitious action on climate change. We will have improved our trade and diplomatic ties on this shared challenge and opportunity. By 2030, more than 82 per cent of the electricity we generate will come from renewable energy. Renewables and storage will dominate our electricity supply, connected to households and industry through new transmission supported through our rewiring the nation policy. By 2030, the Australian government itself will be net zero. By 2030, our national battery strategy will have ensured that we're a serious player in global supply chains, not just supplying lithium and other critical minerals, but making components and batteries here and employing thousands of people as we do so. By 2030, our national EV strategy will mean that we've caught up and affordable electric and hydrogen vehicles are a realistic choice for Australian families. All this is, is achievable, but it's also ambitious. We will succeed. Now we have a government that gets it and we're determined to get on with it. We've wasted a decade. We have not a second now to waste and nor do we intend to. It's time to get on with it. Thank you. Minister, thank you for your, uh, your, your speech there and your, your outlining of, of the Labor's agenda on climate. Um, but can I just go back to, as, as we sort of opened, talking about the energy crisis, which uh, <laughs> fell in your lap in the first few days. Um, how we, we saw the sort of the unprecedented intervention by our EMO, we saw um, pleas for people to sort of cut back their energy use uh, in the evenings. How close did we get to the prospect of um, mass blackouts across the East Coast? And how confident are you that we can sort of avoid um, similar sort of concerns in, in these uh, coming months, particularly the colder months? Well, Andrew, our supply was tight uh, on, at several of the evening peaks. Uh, we would have gone through load shedding before we got to blackouts. Uh, so load shedding was a possibility we were preparing for. Um, I'm confident that that would have avoided blackouts, but I didn't want to go down the load shedding line either. And working together, we managed to avoid that. No load shedding uh, and no blackouts. And that's a tribute to everybody involved. Uh, but it was no easy thing. And as I said, it shows the scale of the problem we're dealing with. Far too many megawatts taken off with not enough megawatts brought on. That's the problem. A deficit in energy generation as well as some market issues. So uh, that was what we were facing. Now, in terms of your question about confidence, I'm very confident 
that all the people who work together to avoid load shedding and blackouts in the recent weeks will continue to do so. As I've said, we run the risk of major unexpected outages. That's, that's a risk when you've got a system that is under pressure. But any challenges we face, we will apply the same determination to put consumers first and ensure reliable energy supply in those difficult circumstances. Thank you. Our first question for today is uh, Mike Foley. Uh, Mike Foley from The Age and Sydney Morning Herald. Thanks for your address, Minister. You mentioned consumers there. Just to, to stay on that sort of unprecedented chaos that rolled across the grid a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, as, as you know, it was the scale of intervention that uh, the market operator had to undertake forcing generators to fire back up and enter the market when they had withdrawn their power will incur you know, a big comp compensation bill under the market rules that they're owed. Um, it's estimated you know, up in the air could be in the billion dollars or more of how much that will be. And as the market rules stand, consumers should bear the cost of that compensation as it flows through to future default market offers potentially. So my question is, will, will the government um, intervene in the market rules? Do you see a need to rewrite the market rules or essentially what can you do to help um, bill payers as you know, inflation costs just rise across the economy? Well, Mike, um, uh, in relation to uh, the compensation to generators, because AMO responded the way they did, uh, therefore the compensation regime is different. That was, that was one of the benefits of their intervention, their, their, as you said, rather extreme intervention, because it means generators are, are compensated for their actual cost, uh, not necessarily opportunity costs, which might apply under different set of arrangements. That's a good thing. Um, it'll take AEMO some months to work through the quantums and work through the process. That's, uh, I would say, a six-month uh, exercise for them to undertake. Uh, in terms of market rules, uh, I'm not uh, anticipating any particular intervention in market rules, but of course state and territory energy ministers will examine all the uh, implications of this crisis and examine all possible options to ensure that consumers continue to come first uh, and that to the degree that we can avoid these short-term challenges in coming months and next year, uh, that every step that has been taken, well, that can be taken, will be taken. So would you advise bill payers to get, you know, prepare for a bit of a hip pocket hit, you know, so they don't get bill shock? Well, we've already, months. I mean, we've already seen the increase in the default market offer, which happened a couple of weeks after the election, of course, was clear to the previous government before the election. They chose not to share that with the Australian people, uh, just as they chose not to share that Stowe was running 18 months late. Uh, so we've already seen that we've been, you know, up front, we're already seeing that pressure. The next question is uh, from Catherine Murphy. Hello, Mr Bowen. Um, can I take you to something that you didn't actually mention in your speech today, and that's the process for rejigging the safeguard mechanism, which will bring down industrial emissions in line with Labor's policy of a 43% cut. Uh, what, can you give us a sense of how you'll conduct that process, given that's the live real world test of whether or not the climate wars have ended? And also related, uh, you've backed the capacity mechanism uh, since taking the portfolio and through the crisis of the last couple of weeks. But why, when you could use the safeguard mechanism, you could engage the safeguard mechanism uh, and uh, and create an explicit emissions reduction trajectory for the national electricity market, perhaps pegged to the ISP or something else, without having to create a bespoke separate policy mechanism, which half the states don't like because they didn't trust how Angus Taylor put it to them and because a number of them think it'll bake in coal for longer. Um, in relation to those, I think, to be fair, probably two questions, uh, Catherine, in relation to the safeguards mechanism, we're engaging, we're beginning the process of engaging in genuine consultation with the sector. It's a big and important policy. We're not going to reduce emissions in, a, in Australia unless we reduce them from our top 215 emitters. I mean, that's why we embarked on the uh, politically challenging decision, because we knew it would be subject to a scare campaign, of reforming safeguards mechanism. But it was absolutely essential. We listened to the business community, we listened to the BCA, we listened to the AIG, and we embarked on that reform. From opposition, we have a mandate to deliver it. But it is complicated, hence a serious process of consultation, hence the 1 July 23 start date. So it, you know, it could not properly be done this year. Uh, we could not, in all good conscience, conscience, make such a big change without proper consultation. Uh, we'll be issuing the first round of consultation documents in August, probably another round in December. We'll be engaging 
uh, very clearly with the sector. We've already done that from opposition to some degree, but now, of course, in government, we will engage in further detail. The Clean Energy Regulator, who's here today, the department, new department, whose secretary's here today, will be uh, helping lead that consultation, and that will be a very real process, because there's, there's many detailed issues to be worked through, but our, our very clear intent is there in our election policy. In relation to the capacity mechanism, I don't quite agree with you, Catherine, that we could achieve a similar aim by some reforms, further reforms to the safeguard mechanism. They're quite different things, in my view. We do have a capacity problem. And the way to do that, the way to deal with that, in my view, is a capacity mechanism, as is quite common around the world in similar economies. Now, I accept your point that there's a lot of cynicism because under the previous government, it would have been used to keep generators alive that shouldn't be kept alive. It would have been used for that purpose. Under us, it won't be. Under us, it will be used as a genuine safety net as we undertake this very significant transformation in the economy. We need that safety net. The last few weeks have reminded anybody who needed reminding that we need that safety net. Under us, it'll be utterly consistent with our emissions reduction target. It will support new technologies. It will support new generation. It will support storage. Now, there are issues that I'm working through with my state and territory colleagues. We unanimously agreed to progress this work at the last meeting. Um, I, I mean very genuinely, I've appreciated the spirit in which all the state and territory energy ministers are engaging with me on it. It is a complex task. I'm very confident that when I announce the capacity mechanism that's been worked through with the state and territory ministers. The ESB has provided a good start to that work. It's now increasingly handed over to us to work those issues through. We need that, that safety net, as I said, under that transformation, but it will complement the transformation to renewables and not get in its way under us. I accept the cynicism that it might have happened differently under previous management. Our next question is Greg Brown. Greg Brown from The Australian. Um, Mr Bowen, Labor's pre-election modelling uh, assumes elect electric vehicles will account for 89 per cent of new car sales by 2030, well above the former government's pr prediction based on their policies on 29 per cent. Now, experts, including the Grattan Institute, say they can't see how this will be achieved based on Labor's already announced policy initiatives, which, which you went through today. Um, noting that free trade deals do make the tariff exemption large, largely redundant. So what is the assumption behind the massive growth in EV sales under Labor? And will the government need new policies in this space, such as vehicle emission standards, to make the 89% prediction a reality? Uh, thanks, Greg. But to be clear, the assumptions in the modelling are, are just that. They're assumptions. They're not policy decisions in relation to those figures. So we didn't have a target of meeting you know, any particular EV uh, rate. So that's not a policy decision. That's what the modellers have worked through. Some of that will be natural increases. Others, other of it will be uh, as a result of policies. But we're very committed to increasing the penetration of electric vehicles and increasing the penetration of electric vehicles at an affordable rate. And there'll be a lot of throw, flow through impacts of our policies that we've already implemented in the process of implementing and have announced. For example, one example, our commitment to take the Commonwealth fleet to, in the first instance, 75% no emissions. Very important. One, because the Commonwealth's a big fleet, you know, 10,000 cars. Uh, but secondly, the Commonwealth turns over its cars every three years. That leads you into the second hand market. At the moment, you can't buy a second hand electric car in Australia. And as we all know, if you really want an affordable car, it's almost certainly a second-hand car. So if you're in the market, if you're in the, in the place of the market, as many young people are, for example, buying their first car, they'd love an EV, but you can't get one second-hand. When the Commonwealth fleet starts to roll through and we have the Commonwealth disposing of its electric vehicles in three years after they've been purchased, you start to get a second-hand market. Same with our private fleets. Our FPT discount and our tariff discount has its biggest impact, I'm happy to concede, on fleets. Again, big, big proportion of car sales in Australia are fleet, but again, they turn over, depending on the company, every two, three or four years, flow through to second hand. So there's a lot to do. And yes, uh, in relation to the second part of your question, we have an electric vehicle strategy, which we will uh, now develop in office, as we said we would from opposition, and we'll consider uh, further policy options to, to add to and build on what we've already committed to. So vehicle emission standards, are they on the table as we move forward? Uh, we will consider all viable options to build on the policy announcements we've already made and are implementing. Thank you. Uh, our next question, Melissa Clark. 
Melissa Clark from ABC. Um, in the recent uh, crisis we had in the energy system, we had AEMO uh, price cap kick in, and subsequent to that, we saw generators withdraw their offers of service. Does that price cap on wholesale spot market prices that was put in, does that price cap need to be reset? Was it too low, having not been reassessed or re-evaluated for a number of years? Are you reviewing where that price cap kicks in? Well, thanks, Melissa. Uh, what I'm mainly interested in reviewing is the causes, not the symptoms. And the fact that prices hit the cap was a, a symptom, not a cause. Yes, it had flow-on impacts on the market and forced AEMO's actions. That is true. But that wasn't actually the driving problem. The driving problem is a range of factors. Yes, the international geopolitical factors, of course, uh, as I've readily uh, acknowledged, uh, there were coal fire power outages, some of which were anticipated, many of which weren't, uh, because we're reliant on an ageing coal fire fleet, uh, because of the lack of investment in new energy generation under previous management. Uh, all these, we had floods in coal mines, which is nobody's fault, you know, but the fact that we weren't prepared for this perfect storm uh, is the major problem. And that is what drove the crisis, not a particular price cap, that was just a symptom. Now, as I said, energy ministers will in due course work through very carefully and methodically anything we need to consider arising out of the situation. But I'm mainly focused on the things which drove the crisis, not which were results of the crisis. Most of those factors are still present. We could well hit that price cap again. Do you anticipate that that price cap will be reached again this winter? Uh, I will be monitoring the situation closely with AEMO. I'm not about to start making predictions other than whatever needs to be done will be done to keep the lights on just as we did in recent weeks. Thank you. Uh, Amelia Dunn. Hi, Minister Bowen. Amelia Dunn from SBS World News. Just on from that question, Japan is going through a heat wave right now and the Japanese government has asked um, their citizens to not use lights where possible, turn off the air con. Obviously, we've just seen the same thing, but in the opposite. Of course, Australia has a very hot summer coming up. Is it possible that, um, as we just asked, we're going to hit that um, point again and we're going to see people like you get up and ask Australians to turn off their air con? And are you discussing that with nations like Japan about how we solve these crises? Yeah, thanks, Amelia. It's a very uh, fair question. But I think that we have to acknowledge, too, that the pressures on the energy system are changing as our energy system changes. In the old days, when I was a boy, uh, summer was the the period of maximum pressure. That's when energy ministers, when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, would come on the TV and say, please turn off your air conditioner. We're changing because we now have much more solar generation. And while solar does play a role in winter, of course, it plays a much bigger role in summer. And we are seeing massive generation from the solar panels in our roofs, one in four houses, in summer. So yes, when our energy use goes up because we all put our swimming pool filters back on and we put the air conditioner on, that is true. That used to put huge pressure on the energy system and still provides some pressure, but we have the solar uh, contribution to offset that, much more than, say, Japan does, because we are the world's leading rooftop solar uh, country. So I don't, think that that, I don't think we should look at it through that prism to say, well, Japan's going through this, so we might, because we're a very different economy. Of course, we remain vigilant to any threats, um, but we are dealing with a very different set of arrangements, both to the past and to countries uh, in our region who are dealing with their own sets of challenges. Thank you. Minus five in Canberra today for anyone at home. So the heaters were getting a, a, a work out there. Um, well, Jade Gailberger. <laughs> Jade Gailberger from the Herald Sun. Uh, the Energy Security Board's latest report on the capacity mechanism warned about the prospect of renewable droughts renewable energy droughts that could last for days in Victoria during winter next decade. Given batteries can currently only last for a few hours at a time and provide that additional support, what kind of generation do you expect will help provide that dispatchable power Victoria is going to need during those droughts? Well, that's 100% right. And we do have to prepare for that. That's the whole, that's the whole point of this ISP on steroids that I'm talking about, to prepare for exactly that situation. Uh, because we do need to store the renewable energy when it's generated and save it for when it's not being generated. And that needs to be both short term, which as you say, batteries. Battery technology is also improving and lasting longer. But as I've said consistently, batteries are vital, but they're not enough. They're great for short term, 
but we need the longer term. We need uh, to store for what the Germans call Dunkelflauter, which is the long uh, winter without wind, or the dark doldrums, uh, which is Dunkelflauter. That's what we need, and our system is not ready for that. So in terms of the long duration storage and ultra long duration storage, uh, then we're looking at pumped hydro, um, which we have some, but not enough. Again, Snowy 2.0 is important, but it's running late. Uh, and then in the longer term, you're looking at green hydrogen, which is ultimately a form of storage and long duration storage. They're the complements to batteries and the longer term storage, but they both take time. Pumped hydro is great, it's got a very important role to play, but there are you know, big environmental approvals to be worked through and green hydrogen is not yet commercial. So these are both issues which I think underline the importance of the work that State and Territory is doing with us uh, for that long term uh, enhanced ISP on all the investments necessary. Uh, Jacob Grieber with our next question. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Andrew. Jacob Grieber from the Australian Financial Review. Minister, just to um, have you look beyond the borders for a moment. Uh, several hours ago, the G70 leaders, who include some of our biggest customers, such as Japan, issued uh, a communique about how they want to reduce, how they want to accelerate their um, the, the end of their dependency on Russia, Russian energy. We stress the role increased deliveries of LNG can play and acknowledge investment is necessary in gas. So rather than talking about gas triggers in Australia or domestic reservations, shouldn't we be exporting more gas to our allies so they can get off Putin's gas? Well, I mean, our allies, whether it be G7 or EU, have, are, are also increasing their ambitions in relation to renewable energy, as they should, as they are. They're increasing their, their medium-term targets, they're increasing their investment in photovoltaics, they're increasing all that, because that also reduces their reliance on Russian gas, as they, as they need to. That is a matter for them, as it is for us, of national security. In our circumstance, I will deal directly with your question, but in terms of the broad, in our circumstance, there's one uh, source of energy that no geopolitical situation can interrupt in relation to our supply chains out or in. And that's the sun to our landmass and the wind on and off our shoreline. That's good energy security. Storing that, uh, that's a matter of national security. In relation to uh, Europe, we should assist them with that transition, both in technology and relation to renewables, wherever we can. Uh, in terms of gas exports, I think we've made very clear our view uh, that the gas sector has a social licence here in Australia and it is required to uh, support the manufacturers in particular who rely so heavily at the moment on it before new technology emerges. Of uh, course, exports have a role to play and those continue and particularly contracted ones that will continue. Uh, but we uh, make no apologies uh, to your question for assessing what policy levers are necessary going forward, including reforms to the ADGSM, which is a particularly blunt instrument. To be fair, it was designed for a different circumstance, not really designed for this circumstance, uh, but it's of no or little use in this circumstance. So hence, uh, we are going through the process of looking at reform options there, and that is the right thing to do. Does it worry you as a follow-up that, that some of these countries appear to be slowing or reducing their ambition because of the very real, very immediate crisis of, uh, caused by the no, invasion? Jacob, I, I, I don't accept with respect your proposition, because I think they're actually increasing their ambition in relation to renewables. Yes. They are saying gas will play a role, as it will, as it will here, as I've made consistently clear. Gas is playing a role here and will continue to. It does have the virtue of being a flexible energy source. Gas fire power stations can be turned on and off much more quickly than coal. So that has a flexibility uh, premium, which is important as we are managing this transition, this transformation. But they are saying gas will continue to play a role in their system for the foreseeable future. I've said the same consistently from opposition government about our system that gas will continue to play a role. We've got to get the balance right and we've got to supercharge that transformation which has been so lacking. Thank you. Uh, Maeve Bannister for your next question. Um, Maeve Bannister from AAP. Um, the UN Climate Change Conference is going to be taking place in Egypt later this year. Will you be going and what message do you think Australia will have for the rest of the world in terms of the policies that you've mentioned today and also working towards uh, net zero targets, which are global targets? Yes, I will be going and the message is we're back. <laughs> Australia's back at the table as a world leader. That's the message I'll be taking to uh, Egypt uh, and this COP. And as I said before, 
if my conversations in the early stages are anything to go by, the response from our partners will be very warm and strong, as it has been from John Kerry, from Jennifer Granholm, from Alok Sharma. A real sense that Australia's back. And I know the Prime Minister has felt the same in his conversations with world leaders. And I expect that to be reflected in Egypt. Um, can I just ask a, a bit of a change of pace question? We, we've seen the Governor General today have to apologise for uh, making a, a video endorsing a Canberra Builders Works doing his home renovations. Now, this was on his private home. It was paid for out of his own pocket and involved the spending of uh, taxpayers' money. Um, but I just was wondering, uh, as, a, as a senior sort of minister in the government, what, what your reaction is to, to that and what does it say about the Governor-General's judgment? I think the Governor-General has said he's made a mistake and apologised for it. I think that's fair enough. I mean, I, I don't think we should be, you know, uh, second-guessing. He's made an honest error and he's done the right thing by acknowledging that error and apologising for it. And I think, I think reasonable Australians will accept that apology. Thank you. Uh, our next question, Simon Gross. Uh, Simon Gross, Canberra IQ. Uh, my question's about carbon offsets. But first, I just want to check my numbers on the 43% target. 43% uh, reduction on 2005, yeah. uh, when our emissions peaked at 641 million tonnes. 43% um, of that is 275 million tonnes brings you down to 366. That's, your, that's what your, uh, your, your 2030 target would be. 351. 351, okay. Um, you're coming off last year, which, is net, which, which was 488 million tonnes. Correct. So you, you, as you said in your speech, you, you need to cut it about uh, 130 million tonnes between now and 2030. Over eight years, that's an average of about 15 plus million tonnes a year. To what, ex uh, to what proportion of those of that reduction would you uh, um, expect to be uh, earned through carbon offsets? Would it be around 50 per cent? Well, it depends um, about what sector you're talking about. Yeah, it won't be much overall. In, well, it won't be much in transport. It won't be anything in transport. Uh, it will be a reasonable amount in uh, safeguards because safeguard facilities will have uh, options as to how they meet the target reductions that are set out by the Clean Energy Regulator in my department that they're obliged to achieve under the safeguard reforms. Uh, and so offsets will be an important part of that. And we'll, we've said we'll create a new safeguard offset, which will be similar to but separate to ACCUs. Um, and they will play a role and they should play a role. And that's why it's important we get the governance of those uh, carbon credits right. And so I, that's why we're having an, an integrity review, which I'll say more about in the not too distant future. Um, but a reasonable amount will come from offsets, particularly around that safeguards and industry sector, not electricity or transport or the other sectors. So your modelling for your target doesn't include some kind of ballpark for offsets? As no, no, it does. It does. It does in relation to safeguards. I'd have to check the exact figures, but it does go through uh, an expected or predicted amount which would be offset by uh, offsets or which would be achieved by offsets. That's in the modelling. Thank you. Next question, uh, Matt Kaloran from Courier Mail. G'day, Minister. Matt Kaloran from the Courier Mail. Thanks for your time. Um, in, in the lead up to the elections, part of your, your, your uh, Powering Australia policy, you promised voters uh, electricity price cuts of up to $275 by 2025. Uh, we've, we've just seen some, some uh, sustained uh, record high wholesale electricity prices, which will be flowing on to consumers as, as Mike Foley touched on potentially compensation to the generators uh, also being passed on to consumers. Uh, how will you be able to, to deliver those promised price electricity bill savings onto consumers? And will they even be able to notice them if wholesale prices are driving and being passed on to, to consumers in, in the coming years? Well, Matt, you're right. Um, but this is even more important. Our policies are even more important in the light of what we're dealing with. You know, in the light of uh, the fact that we're dealing with this, have been dealing with this crisis in light of the fact that Snowy 2.0 is running 18 months late, which is a recent revelation, in light of the fact that the default mark offer has gone up after the election, which is a recent revelation, sure that makes our task harder, but it makes it even more important. And it is truer than ever that renewables are the cheapest form of energy. 
So it is more important than ever to get them into the system, and that's exactly what our policies will do, and that's exactly what they'll achieve, and they will achieve a downward pressure on power, on power prices. Are you confident still, though, in, in those figures on, on that? Well, as I said, it's more important than ever. Of course, figures will move around. You know, since the modelling was done, we've seen Snowy 2.0 running late, we've seen default market offer, offer going up. But I'm very, very confident that the policy impact, which we modelled, will be met, and that is uh, downward pressure on prices through more renewables in the system. Thank you. Uh, next question, Dan Jarvis Barty. Dan Jervis Barty from the Canberra Times. Thanks for your speech, Minister. Just a question about the negotiations with the crossbench on the climate change bill. You mentioned that you're willing to consider what you described as sensible additions. A number of the crossbenchers, including Zali Stegall and David Pocock, have suggested that they would like to see the 43% considered a floor rather than a ceiling. Would you consider including a provision or at least flagging through your rhetoric that that 43% would be a floor rather than a ceiling to Labor's emissions reduction ambitions? Well, thanks, Dan, but of course it's not a ceiling. Of course it's not a ceiling. I mean, we're hardly going to treat it as a ceiling. Um, it is the modelled impact of our policies, and that's what we reflected in our legislation. But in terms of your question, uh, which is a fair one in relation to our rhetoric, I draw your attention to our nationally determined contribution, which the Prime Minister and I sent to the United Nations a couple of weeks ago. It says, our aspiration is that the commitments of our industry, states and territories, and the Australian people will yield even greater emissions reductions in the coming decade. That's what we told the UN a couple of weeks ago. I guess the previous government might have used the term meet and beat. If that's the way you want to describe it, that's fine. Just can I do a quick follow up to the, the Greens have, they would like to see a, a temporary moratorium on new coal and gas. They said that's prior to the election, that was almost a red line. Is that something you would describe as a sensible addition to, to your bill that you'd be willing to consider? No, because there's environmental approvals to go through in normal processes. I understand, you know, the Greens' position. I respect the mandate they have from their voters. I would, I would uh, put to them, we have a mandate from the Australian people as the party that formed majority in the House of Representatives. As I said, and I've said the same to the crossbenchers, both Greens and independents, Happy if you've got sensible suggestions which complement our agenda, more than happy to look at those. Some That might be changes to the bill or additions to the bill. It might be other things that we can work on together. I mean, we are actually all in together. And I have um, worked pretty hard to develop a good and respectful relationship with the crossbench in the first month. Um, because, you know, we are all after a country which pulls its weight and seizes the jobs opportunity. Uh, but anything which is inconsistent with our mandate and our agenda is not something that we'll entertain. Um, what's the danger? You, you've said, the governor said, you know, you don't necessarily need to legislate 43%. What's the danger if we don't get that legislated? I think, Andrew, it's about certainty and stability, mainly for the business and investment community. It sends a signal, if, you, if a parliament hasn't legislated, that maybe the country's not serious and maybe a future government, heaven forbid, uh, a Liberal government might walk it back. If you've legislated it, I just think it's a best practice. It just provides that certainty for business. That's why we're seeking to do it. That's, I'm not sure I'd use the term danger, but that's the, that's the downside of not legislating. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially lock in perhaps a, a, a future sort of coalition government if we have one between now and 2030? Well, well, I mean, you know, the parliament will have legislated if we're successful in getting the legislation through, which I hope to be. Uh, and, you know, certainly, uh, intend to be. But, you know, as I said, as I've been crystal clear from opposition uh, and in government, position's the same. We'll seek to legislate, but if the parliament doesn't wish to legislate, I mean, we're not going to spend three years, you know, arguing about the legislation and sending it back and forth. We've already notified the UN. The legislation is good practice to lock it in, but we're just getting on with it. And if the parliament doesn't want to legislate, we'll just continue to get on with it. Next question, Anna Henderson. Anna Henderson, SBS and NITV. You're heading to the Torres Strait imminently. What can you offer the people of the Torres Strait? What is the infrastructure cost that you're expecting? And what are the islands going to look like over the next decade? How many more seawalls will we, we be expecting? And I'm sorry to create a shopping list here, but the, the question that the Torres Strait Islander communities is asking is what's the long-term ambition of the government to help us? And, and what is that long-term ambition? And a fair question, but I think I think, to be honest, I'll be better placed to answer that when I come back. I mean, that's why I'm going. That's why Jenny's coming with me. I had a very genuine exercise. I've asked Jenny to have 
day-to-day uh, -day carriage working closely with me on adaptation, we're going to listen very genuinely. I'm not sure the last time an energy minister or climate change minister visited uh, the Torres Strait, but, but I'm going fairly early because I really genuinely want to hear from traditional owners in a meaningful way about what they're dealing with, what they're worried about, what's on their agenda. I've had meetings with them, to be clear, mm. you know, virtually and, and in person, but I haven't been onto their country and I'm going as a sign of respect to listen to them on their country about what they want to see happen. And then Jenny and I will bring that back and we'll talk to our cabinet colleagues and we'll work it through. But I'm not, I'm not complaining about your question, but I'm not in a position to answer what they need until I've been there and heard from them in a very genuine process. They are already talking about the need for more seawall investment yep. and other infrastructure. My question, I guess, is on the briefings that you have, mm. what are you expecting is the threat that is being posed to them over the real, next decade? Real and substantial. And, you know, uh, we've, heard, we've heard it from them direct, as you said, quite correctly, we've heard it from them. But I want to go and see it. And I want to, I want to walk their country with them and hear it from them. Uh, and I think that will better place Jenny and I to make recommendations to our cabinet colleagues about what needs to happen from here. Um, I, I think it's important for us to go there. These are Australian citizens, our brothers and sisters, at the front line more than anybody in dealing with the impacts of climate change, and they deserve to have a federal government which listens to them, and that's exactly what Jenny and Nita and Yana and I will be doing over the next 24 hours. And many of them want a higher 2030 target. So what will you say to them? When I, I, I'll be saying to them, our target is ambitious. As I said before, 90 months is not long to turn this big cruise ship around, uh, to reduce our emissions by that level. But I completely understand that they want to see this issue dealt with and they now have a government that wants to deal with it. Thank you. Uh, next question, John Keogh. Thanks, Minister. John Keogh from the Australian Financial Review, and um, you've certainly had a baptism of fire in the new portfolio. I'm just thinking about internationally at the moment, further to Jacob's question, um, there's been criticisms of the G7 overnight um, supposedly backsliding on some of their climate commitments and outlook and use of gas. But just more broadly beyond that, uh, we've seen Germany fire, fire up uh, mothballed coal-fired powered stations. China's Premier in the last couple of days has encouraged more coal-fired generation because of the concerns about blackouts. And the UK has also cancelled uh, subsidies for electric vehicles. So there does seem to be a bit of a shift in international thinking on climate and energy at the moment. Are you worried that there's a loss of ambition now, but more pertinently that the road to net zero, the emissions reduction, could be a lot more bumpy because of the energy crunch that we're now experiencing and countries reacting to that? Well, I guess, John, yes, it is going to be bumpy, but I'm not particularly surprised by that. I mean, um, I think that was inevitably going to be the case, but I actually don't no, I'm not worried about a, a, a backsliding of ambition because I think serious leaders around the world get it that actually the transformation is more important than before. If you don't want to be reliant on gas, it's more important to be uh, increasing your renewables. Uh, yes, there's short-term challenges, you know, people having to, um, in our case, you know, try and get our existing coal-fired power stations working when they're breaking down and getting coal to them. That's been a challenge for me and my state and territory colleagues in recent weeks, but all that is a daily reminder to me, and at some points during this crisis, four or five times a day, in my briefings via email, about how important this transfer transformation is, and how it's more important that we get on with it, so that if this situation happens again in a couple of years' time, IMO can say to me at that point, well, it's okay, Minister, because we've got all these batteries that we're calling on now, we've got all this storage, we've got an improved transmission line so we can get the power more efficiently through, it's okay because we're developing this green hydrogen uh, plan, so we're in a much better place than we were a few years ago. That's why it's important. Okay, yep. Uh, next question, uh, Julie Hare. Minister, thank you for your speech. Julie Hare, from, also from the Australian Financial Review. Apologies for that. And um, right. I'm also a director of the National Press Club. Too much Press Financial Club. Review is never Yeah, enough. yeah. That's we're we're on mass today. <laughs> um, on Tuesday's uh, state budget, the Queensland government massively increased royalties from coal mining. Um, I'm just trying to get your thoughts on that, what that means for the Australia's energy transition and whether maybe other coal-rich states such as New South Wales should follow suit. Oh, I have no idea whether any other states contemplating that. It's a matter for them. 
Um, but I completely understand the need for states to ensure fair revenue for their residents from the resources that are under their ground. Is it a super profits tax? I wouldn't have thought so, but uh, it's, it's an it's a increase in royalties, which is entirely a matter for state uh, governments and entirely appropriate for them to ensure fair share for the residents of their state. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're back to uh, Mike Foley. Yeah, back for more. Um, <laughs> this is because my answers have been short and to the point. It's, it's good. It's very good. <laughs> Too succinct for your own good. No hot air at the point. Okay, I can deal with that. <laughs> I'm just wondering about uh, back on offsets and you, you, when you talk about um, Labor's open to potentially approving new gas um, export projects, for example, and you state quite clearly that any of those new emissions will be captured by uh, your safeguard mechanism if they, they hit the trigger, which they would. What, what role does Labor see uh, international offsets, uh, carbon offsets, playing in a future economy? Um, the, the former coalition government obviously banked a hell of a lot on international offsets achieving net zero. Um, or could Labor rule out any use of international offsets? Um, do you think, it, or do you think it'll play a significant role in um, Australia's net zero push? I think, Mike. I think we would proceed with caution. You know, there are some international offsets already, um, you know, arrangements with Fiji, for example, that's all fine and appropriate. Um, I think I can, I can see theoretically uh, in the importance of international offsets, but we will not do anything unless we are entirely satisfied about the integrity of those offsets uh, and that they were real and that it would not impact in any way adversely for our national ambitions. Um, but I'd work those issues through carefully based on expert advice at the time if there was something sensible. I'm not ideological about it like the previous government was, you know, all for it, gung ho. Uh, nor do I rule out entirely a role for international offsets only if carefully managed, properly calibrated, fully uh, fully uh, vetted and audited in terms of integrity. So it might be part of a future review that you're doing? Of Look, it's not something that I'm that is very high on my list at the moment by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm not going to rule out that at any point, if we were satisfied, that it could play a carefully designed and calibrated role in the system, but it would need to be very carefully worked through. Uh, Catherine Murphy. We didn't actually caucus, but I'll ask the other half of Mike's question just back on uh, permits and, uh, and integrity, which you've mm -hmm. raised. You've flagged that there's a review forthcoming. Andrew McIntosh, who's the respected expert in this field, has said uh, that uh, the permits or credit system currently is a fraud, uh, which has hurt the environment and wasted more than a billion dollars in taxpayer funding. What's your own view? Obviously, you're, you're seeking a review, but are you anticipating that that review will find major problems with the system? Catherine, I'm not going to preempt it, other than to say it will be serious and very credible. And when you see the calibre of the names uh, that I've appointed to undertake that review, I think you'll agree that it, the government is taking it seriously. Um, it will be a thoroughly independent, proper review without predetermined views one way or another. And that's as it should be. I don't have a predetermined view. Uh, that would be wrong. I think the concerns raised by Professor McIntyre are substantial and real and should be taken seriously. To be fair, we had already committed to this review because we had our own concerns before uh, the Australia Institute uh, raise these concerns, but I take the concerns raised very seriously. I've said the same to the Australia Institute, to the Carbon Market Institute. These are big and serious issues which need to be addressed because we are going to rely on credits, whether they be ACCUS or safeguard credits. I do want integrity. I want, I want confidence in the system. I want the Australian people to have confidence in the system. And unless and until we have that review, that will be lacking because these serious concerns have been raised. So it is in everybody's best interest to have this thorough review. So I will be saying more about it in coming days. It will be, as I said from opposition, thorough but concise. So I'll ask it to undertake its work in a six month period, uh, but it will be separate from government and whatever the results are, we'll all have to live with it. If, if it finds everything's hunky-dory, if it finds there are serious issues to be addressed, if it finds things can be improved, we'll just get on with the job. Our last question of the day, uh, Melissa Clark from the ABC again. Thank you, Minister. Melissa from ABC again. Um, I want to ask you on Snowy 2.0, which you've mentioned. Can you tell us what you've been advised, or perhaps as much the Finance Minister as yourself when it comes to Snowy? Um, both of us. We're both equal shareholders. Excellent. Um, what have you been advised is the time frame for completion? What reasons have you been given for the delays? 
Are they anything that could see subsequent delays? And have you been given a new total figure of what the project is now expected to cost? Uh, Melissa, the project is currently running around 18 months late. Um, there are a range of factors which have led to this. To be fair, this is a big and complex project. You know, some very steep tunnelling to be done. It's, I understand you know, why these things can get difficult. There have also been some supply chain issues which construction projects around the world are dealing with. I understand that so too. So you think supply chain and geotechnical? Yeah, yeah and some COVID related you know, delays. All this, is, all, this is, all this is factors. I just prefer, would have preferred that the previous government was upfront about that instead of you know, their signature policy. Well, the signature is pretty smart just because it's running so much late, so, so late. Now, Snowy will work to try and reduce that in months, as they should, uh, but I also have to be honest with you and say, of course, there's risks as well. Uh, but 18 months is the current best assessment as to how late it is running. Then you have a separate issue about transmission, of course, because it's got to be plugged in. It can generate all the electricity you like. And unless you plug it into the grid, it's not going to do much good. That's a separate issue. I will also would have liked to have seen more progress on that in the past as well. Uh, but we'll continue to work uh, to rectify both of those issues as best we can uh, through all the levers of government we have available to us. Do you have a, f a figure, an updated No, I haven't been provided with, a, with a, any particular cost flow, I figure, no. Thank you. Unlike Snowy 2.0, we're not running late, but let's conclude on that note, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Please thank the Honourable Chris Bowen. Minister, here's a, a membership card for the uh, press club. We're on time and on budget. Thank you. <laughs>